I, if, if people don't mind, I, I, I hate just you having to stare at me the whole time, but I also hate PowerPoints. So I'm gonna try to mix it up a little bit and do a little bit of a PowerPoint to give you just some background and, uh, and then I'll come back on and, um, and do um, you know, some in-person and you'll, you'll have to uh, stare at me again. But, um, but bear with me for this, uh, hopefully it'll work out. I'm not as uh, tech savvy as Lacey is, but we'll see if this, this works. Um, so hopefully everybody can see uh, the screen that uh, this presentation is called Living with a Cold Case. Um, there's me, uh, Ryan Backman. There's my email address and the, the website of the organization I started, projectcoldcase.org. Um, that's me speaking at the National Press Club that, uh, in Washington, D.C. that Lacey mentioned earlier. We met with um, lawmakers to try to include cold case uh, homicides in the Uniform Crime Report a few years ago. Um, this is my dad. Uh, as, as Lacey mentioned, um, he's the victim of a, of a cold case homicide. And um, to give you a little bit of insight into that, that murder, um, as you can see on October 10th, 2009, um, my dad was, um, was working uh, on a, a, he was a construction worker. It was a Saturday afternoon and um, he had picked up a side job on a construction site and um, somebody walked in, uh, saw him in there by himself, walked in and, um, and robbed him and, and shot him. So uh, I was on the other side of town. I didn't know that my dad was working that day. I was watching college football, uh, getting ready to go to some friend's house. I jumped in the shower. When I got out, there was a, uh, a missed call from a blocked number and a voicemail. When I checked the voicemail, they said, um, this is Detective so-and-so from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. There's been an emergency and we need you to call us right away. So in my world, you know, kind of a naive sheltered world, the worst that could have happened is a car accident with maybe somebody in the hospital with some broken ribs or something. So I called the number back. Um, the detective answered and asked me if I was at home. I said I was. He said, well, we're turning into your neighborhood right now. Uh, we'll be at your house in a minute. And I said, well, is everything okay? And they said, no, uh, but we'll tell you what happened, you know, what's going on when we get there. Uh, I immediately, you know, I hung up the phone. I turned to my wife. I told her that uh, something bad had happened, that the police were on their way. And I walked out the front door. Uh, by the time I got to the end of my driveway, um, I saw uh, unmarked car pull up and two plainclothes detectives get out. They introduced themselves and they said, we hate to tell you this, but your father was murdered earlier today. Um, so there's obviously no real way to prepare yourself um, for something like that. Uh, I was obviously in shock. Um, you have lots of questions, but you kind of assume that, uh, that the case will be solved and it'll be solved relatively quickly. You know, but as the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months, and unfortunately, months turn into years, you, um, you really start to, to, to question whether that case will ever be solved. And so I, uh, I decided to switch careers within a year of my dad's murder. I was a project manager um, at an at a architectural firm. And um, within a year of my dad's murder, I left that, that industry and became a victim advocate working at a nonprofit in Jacksonville, Florida that helped families that had lost loved ones uh, to homicide, violent crime. I spent about four years working with them, all the while my dad's case um, getting colder and colder and, and further away from, um, from an arrest. And I started to really recognize a need for an, an agency or an organization to assist families of specific cold case homicides. And I, I recognized that, you know, um, a lot of families that, that had cases that were solved spent a lot of time questioning about court and, you know, complaining about the slow wheels of justice. And, uh, and a lot of us who didn't have arrests in our case were kind of left off to the side, you know, wishing we were, could complain about those slow wheels of justice. So, um, so I'd recognized the need. And in 2015, I started Project Cold Case. Um, I took all my four and a half, five years of experience um, 
and, and everything I had learned and done and, and started an organization uh, with the help of, you know, a very supportive wife, uh, an incredible board of directors that was, you know, hand selected for the assistance they could provide and volunteers. And, and we started working uh, and we started helping the families in Jacksonville that we knew had cold cases. And quickly that turned into families from all across the country that found us online. So, um, so I wanna just kind of, um, you know, give a, a, some brief questions, you know, brief about uh, some common questions that we receive when we do these kinds of presentations. And then we'll get back to a, um, you know, more of a Q&A. I hope that, that um, you guys that are watching will um, ask questions, you know, make comments, participate, because this will be a lot more uh, interesting uh, if you do. Um, but uh, what is a cold case? You know, there is no uh, legal definition of a cold case. What law enforcement does is they pretty much consider a case cold when all of the investi investigative leads have, have run out. So they've They've interviewed all the witnesses. Um, they've tested all the physical evidence. Um, they have re-interviewed witnesses, uh, you know, sent more things to be tested, and they've run out of all those items of physical evidence. And um, you know, it asked everybody that that was uh, that may have information, and still have not been able to identify a suspect or make an arrest. And there is a difference there because a lot, unfortunately, a lot of cold cases. Law enforcement does know who committed the crime, um, but they, uh, they don't have enough evidence to prosecute the crime. So those arrests don't happen. And that's really where we step in because we work hard to raise awareness for those cases and share those cases um, with the public in hopes that someone that may have had information back when it originally happened, but didn't feel comfortable coming forward, maybe because of a relationship they were in, you know, an addiction um, dependency situation, those kinds of things. Uh, maybe that's changed and, um, and maybe they're willing to come forward now and, um, and help. So, uh, so that's when a case is cold, you know, for most jurisdictions is when all the evidence has, has run out and it hasn't led to anywhere. And that typically takes at least a year, especially in a a larger agency, um, they'll be working a case, you know, pretty hard for a year, if for no other reason than sending evidence to the lab and getting it back. Um, that, that can take a while in itself. Um, so when is a case cold? You know, there is no set, set time. Like I said, uh, for our agency, we, uh, we ask families to give law enforcement at least a full year before, from the incident before reaching out to us and submitting their loved one to our organization. And again, we don't investigate those cases. We assist law enforcement. Um, and we do that through a lot of ways, um, you know, mostly raising awareness and assisting with advocacy for the families. Um, but there is no set time frame. So it's not a, it's not a year, it's not two years, it's not five years. Um, how many cold cases are in the, you know, cold case murders are in the United States? An estimated 250,000 just since 1980. And I know that graphic is, is very uh, pixelated, but it says, uh, based on FBI uniform crime reporting data, our nation currently has 250,000 unsolved murders, a number that increases by about 6,000 each year. And, uh, and again, that's just dating back to 1980. So, um, uh, it, it's not going back. We see cases solved uh, regularly from the 70s, and those wouldn't even be included in that 250,000 number. Um, and, you know, I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. We have over 1,500 unsolved murders in Jacksonville, Florida alone. Um, for those of you in Tallahassee, we have a database that uh, we keep uh, up with cases as much as we can. And there was, I think when I checked yesterday, there was like 40 three cases from um, Leon County and, and the Tallahassee Police Department. I don't know how accurate that number is as a whole, but those are the, the cases that we've been able to, to, um, to find in that area. So uh, I get, uh, this question came about because I always had people that cared to my face about my dad's murder. They were always very sympathetic, um, even empathetic, uh, but then they would go about their business and they would never 
I'd never hear from them again. They'd always say, if I could ever help, let me know, or I'll reach out to you and uh, maybe I can assist with something. And then I'd never hear from them again. And I started to realize that, you know, just like I did before I was uh, impacted by, by violence, we kind of isolate ourselves and we think like it can't happen to us. It won't happen to us. I live in a nice neighborhood. Um, and, and one thing that I've learned since doing this is that it can happen to anybody at any time. And so the real concern and why people that haven't been impacted by violence should care about what you know, Project Cold Case does and what our, our families are going through is because it's a public safety issue. For every one of these suspects that committed one of these unsolved murders, there's the chance that they live down the street from your child's bus stop, that they shop at the same grocery store you do, that they are in line behind you at the bank. And when you think about it in those terms, um, it's, it's a, it makes it a little higher of a priority. One thing we deal with with cold cases is they're always the lowest priority. Um, a lot of agencies don't even have dedicated cold case units, and they tell their homicide detectives, hey, when you have time, go pick a cold case up off the shelf and, um, and, and give it a look. And the reality is, is officers just don't, detectives don't have that kind of extra time on their hands. So, um, so we really push that it's a public safety issue and that um, everybody should be concerned about cold cases because um, these suspects are, are, you know, of course, potentially suspects are dead or in prison, um, but just as, uh, as likely they are uh, out in our community, you know. Um, shouldn't it be easier to solve cases with today's technology? So um, I pared down this, this slideshow because I didn't want to stay on a PowerPoint you know, too long, um, but, uh, but in, 19, in the 1960s, uh, homicides were solved at a 90% clearance rate. And in 2018, it was a 62% clearance rate. So contrary to what we believe with the advancements in technology, um, you know, cameras everywhere, uh, you know, crime stoppers and rewards, uh, despite all that, the clearance rate on, on homicides has dropped drastically um, since the, the 1960s. Um, so that's a scary thought. Now we can catch people now that we wouldn't have caught in the 1960s because of genetic genealogy, uh, private lab testing of DNA mixtures, um, you know, fingerprint technology, um, and those, those things, surveillance cameras, cell phones. Uh, lots of reasons why we can uh, arrest people today, but it doesn't necessarily translate into uh, a higher num clearance number. Obviously, more homicides today, too. Um, this is uh, just a, a real quick, um, you know, I, it would take a, a, an hour to show pictures of all of the, the victims that we serve uh, and the families that we serve. But I like to throw this up in the, in the presentation so people understand it, that we're not talking about one demographic. We're not talking about one race, gender, you know, one side of town. Um, these are the, the faces of the families that, that we serve. These are the, each one of these is a victim of an unsolved uh, homicide. And um, so, you know, that's just a, a quick, quick uh, glimpse to show the diversity and show the, you know, the ages. And, um, and hopefully, you know, our goal when we show pictures like that is people feel like they can relate. You know what I mean? They see a picture and they say, oh my gosh, that looks like, you know, my grandfather. Oh my gosh, that looks like my neighbor. Oh my gosh, that looks like my cousin, you know? And they start to, to connect these victims on a personal level. Um, obviously, uh, as a goal that we can, um, can then move forward and try to, um, try to resolve the case one way or the other. So I know that uh, there's some, some Tallahassee people there. We're, we're um, doing this presentation for the Tallahassee Museum. Um, uh, hopefully there's some people from other places as well. But this is one of the older cases and more um, you know, popularized cases in, uh, in Tallahassee. Uh, the Sims family, Robert, Helen, and, and Joy were um, attacked in their own home, um, uh, you know, um, way back in the, the 60s, I believe, I can't 
can't remember right off the top of my head. Um, but uh, there was a Florida State football game going on. Um, it had just ended when one of the Sims' other daughters came home from babysitting and came into the house and, and found her uh, parents and her younger sister uh, had been attacked. Uh, Robert and Joy, um, you know, passed away um, right away, pretty much. Uh, Helen was in the hospital for nine days um, on life support, uh, clinging to life. And the, uh, obviously, investigators were hoping all along that she would be able to regain consciousness and, um, and talk about, uh, maybe identify who had done this. Um, that didn't happen. And the case still remains unsolved to this day. There's a, a, a like a school documentary that somebody did, or a university documentary that somebody did called um, uh, I think it's 641 Muriel Court, which was the address that they they lived. Um, so I I know a little bit about that. I had planned to watch the the documentary again today before um, being contacted by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office about today's um, cold case arrest. So uh, again, real quick, I'll just leave that up for a second. If anybody wants to, to visit our website, we have a Faces of Unsolved Homicide page with all of the, the victims that have been submitted to our organization. We have a cold case database that has over 24,000 unsolved murders from across the country. Um, we have spotlights that we do weekly on, uh, on different victims to, to share and, and try to uh, raise awareness for the case. Um, I think as of today, I think we are up to 20 cases that have been featured on our website that have been solved. Um, we use social media uh, very often because um, it's free advertising, it's free awareness. And, um, and, you know, we all have seen the stories of, you know, somebody finding a, you know, class ring from the 70s on, you know, uh, Daytona Beach for during spring break or something and using social media to reconnect that uh, jewelry with the owner and if you can you know if you can reconnect jewelry with an owner then uh, why can't we solve or resolve a, a, a cold case um, so we do have Facebook Twitter we also have Instagram um, and we share that stuff uh, very often so um, again, we can answer questions. Uh, I can answer questions as they come in. Uh, if anybody has anything, just, just chime in. Uh, otherwise, I can, you know, go into some more detail about, um, you know, today's case. Um, I can't get too specific about the one that was solved today because obviously there's still a trial that has to come. And, um, uh, but what I can tell you is that uh, in 1999, I, um, a, a grocery store owner, a convenience store owner, um, was leaving his house and was attacked in his driveway in a gated community um, in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, his wife heard a scream when she came out. She saw um, a, a man and woman dragging her husband into the garage, stabbing him. Um, she screamed. The woman in the case, uh, the, the woman suspect, grabbed the wife, took her inside found her um, and they uh, started going through the house looking for, for money. Um, that case uh, really went cold fast um, and it was not until, that was 1999, it wasn't until 2003 that they went back and looked at the evidence and found physical DNA at the scene. Um, they ran that DNA through CODIS, the national um, database of, of DNA for offenders. And, um, and came back no results. Uh, so then more recently, you have probably heard of genetic genealogy. Uh, the sheriff's office utilized genetic genealogy to identify the two suspects in a case. Um, one of the male suspect we found out today was a, uh, was a detective with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office when he committed the murder. Um, he, had information that the family had large amounts of, of cash in the uh, in their um, home. And so he took his wife and went to the home and, uh, and attacked the, the family and, and killed uh, the husband. So um, 21 years later, uh, detectives brought him in last night for questioning. 
and um, made an arrest. Uh, today, they flew to Missouri, where they arrested his uh, now ex-wife uh, for her part in the crime. And so, um, for those of you that have uh, heard about genetic genealogy, it's uh, probably the biggest breakthrough in cold case investigation since DNA. Uh, genealogists, if any of you out there are, are uh, you know, do your own family tree on Ancestry.com or Family Tree DNA. Um, you, you know what uh, genealogy is. Um, law enforcement takes DNA from a suspect and uploads it to a public database to compare it um, to other individuals that have voluntarily uploaded their DNA and given law enforcement permission to compare. A lot of times what that means is an unknown suspect's DNA matches um, a, a genealogist, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, a, a armchair genealogist DNA on a level that is, you know, second cousins, third cousins, aunts, uncles, and there's actually a, a unit of measurement that tells you how much DNA you have in common. Um, so then the genealogists use that DNA, they find the known person, and they build a family tree backwards um, with the unknown person until they meet uh, with a couple, you know, they meet a match, and then they build that tree back down uh, to identify the suspect. And so um, it is a very tedious process. It's a lot of research, <coughs> excuse me, because you're dealing with a lot of unknowns. You have one known person, you have to find their parents, then you find their parents, then their parents, and their parents, on and on and on, until you get closer to this person over here. And once you find somebody that's in that um, same family line on that side, you build back down. Uh, in some cases, genealogists can literally provide uh, investigators with an, uh, the name of the suspect. The person that, that provided that DNA is X. Um, but law enforcement then has to investigate that, make sure that the, um, the, the person that they're saying, you know, did this, had crime, had opportunity, had motive, was in that area, um, and then they still have to do a physical comparison, a one-to-one -one comparison of that person's DNA uh, to confirm that belief because, you know, uh, sometimes DNA is left at the scene that doesn't belong to a killer. It's just DNA that was left at the scene, and so investigators still have to to look that up and figure out, you know, exactly um, if that person is a, is a suspect. And that's what they did in this case. Um, the family, uh, the, the, the wife that was also attacked, um, she still lives in the area. Um, she was actually really, really scared. Uh, we got the local media to do a story on this case back in January and February. And, um, and the wife, asked the, you know, the media not use her name, um, that she declined to participate in the, um, in the interviews, you know, and basically out of fear, which was um, completely understandable, but also um, terrifying, you know, that even after uh, that amount of time, she was scared that whoever had done that to her husband was going to come back um, and, and potentially hurt her. Uh, so, um, but I was able to speak to the family, um, a lot today. I spent a lot of time on the phone with the family today. And um, obviously you can imagine after 21 years, um, that there's a, a lot of elation today and, and getting answers and knowing that the people responsible will be held accountable and that, um, that they're not going to get away with it. So, um, so it was a, a really good day, um, you know, as far as that goes. Uh, do we, I see we have one question here, mm -hmm. right? Let me see. Uh, uh, we do. We have uh, Michelle asked, since DNA, why is the government so reluctant to test to solve these crimes? Yeah, so, I mean, it's hard to answer why they're so reluctant. I think, um, one, genetic genealogy is, is particularly expensive um, right now. It's brand new technology. Now, genetic genealogy is different than just testing DNA. And I think most um, law enforcement agencies test DNA pretty quickly now. Like, I don't think there's much of a holdup. Obviously, there was um, rape kits that were held up for a long time. And once that was discovered, um, there was a lot of funding that was allocated uh, to, to testing those kits. 
Um, with homicides, that's the easy way to solve a crime. In fact, uh, prosecutors, uh, um, detectives, you know, they would love to have the perfect case that has, you know, DNA evidence, uh, eyewitnesses, surveillance footage, and a confession. That's, that's what they want um, more than anything else. And um, so uh, they're quick to, to, to look for those DNA cases now. But in a jurisdiction like Jacksonville, where there's 1,500 unsolved murders um, dating back to the 70s, how, how do you know which ones have uh, DNA? None of these... Uh, None of these cases before 2011 were even digital in Jacksonville. So they've gone back and are starting to digitize those and, and note which ones have DNA so that they can test it. Um, there was not really DNA in my dad's case. There was, um, this was uh, Terry's question, was there DNA found in my father's case? So they believe, the, the theory is that my dad was vacuuming up drywall with us. And um, whoever, there was somebody, a random person was walking through the parking lot, saw my dad inside this building at 12.20 in the afternoon, uh, walked in, my dad was vacuuming and not paying attention. Uh, they believe that the suspect pressed the gun against my dad. And when he did that, that it may have startled my dad. Um, and then in a reaction, the uh, suspect pulled the trigger. Um, and they think that that he, the suspect may have then reached into my dad's pockets and pulled his wallet out and then turned around and left. My, my dad lived long enough to call 911 um, and give a brief description. And actually, um, he spent the last seven minutes of his life on the phone with the 911 dispatcher and lost consciousness before the uh, paramedics arrived. Uh, but um, so they have gone back you know, a few years ago and tested the, the back pocket of my dad's pants to see if there was what they call touch DNA, um, you know, skin cells that may be rubbed off in the back uh, pocket of my dad's pants. If that individual did um, pull it out, uh, there was determined to be a mixture of DNA. The most DNA was my dad's. The other, um, you know, contributor uh, was not enough DNA to make a comparison by a long shot to anybody right now. Um, so there's a chance that as technology progresses, that maybe they'll need less and less and less DNA. But I mean, we're talking a very, very small amount, like amount that right now um, the labs just shake their head and say, there's you know nothing we can do. Uh, but um, uh, you know, we always hold out hope. There's also the potential that it's it's not the suspect's DNA, that it's, you know, my, my stepmother's DNA, or, you know, when she, um, you know, put his pocket back in after washing and drying his jeans or, you know, his pants. So, um, so the, there's that possibility that it could lead to something uh, down the road. Uh, my dad's case was, um, uh, was, had an enhanced reward of $13,000 for about the first four years. Uh, I mentioned my dad was in the construction business. He was working a side job the day he was murdered. Uh, his his full-time job uh, was building a uh, an oceanfront home in Ponte Vedra Beach. And the um, the owner of that home, when he found out my dad had been murdered, he, he put up a $10,000 reward uh, to an enhancement for the reward, uh, hoping for... Um, information and a tip. And, uh, and I've spoken with the executive director of the local Crime Stoppers uh, ever since, you know, for over 10 years now since my dad was murdered. And um, he says, my dad's case is one of maybe two that he has ever seen with an enhanced reward that never got the first tip, never got um, uh, uh, any kind of lead or, I mean, nobody even called with information, even fake information uh, on my dad's case. And we had press conferences, we had billboard, um, you know, uh, it was in the, the newspaper. Um, you know, fortunately, you know, for me, um, my dad was a victim that was, um, that was newsworthy. He, um, he was working on a Saturday, working an extra job to make extra money during a, a terrible recession, and was also doing that to support his, his wife of 24 years who was um, uh, suffering from terminal cancer. 
And so uh, all of those things combined to make a, a juicy headline. Um, so they followed the story. Uh, they did a lot of media on the story, um, but nobody ever came forward. Nobody ever called. Um, I've, you know, I've wondered before if it was somebody passing through town, um, but uh, investigators don't seem to believe that. They seem to think in that area that there was some, um, some drugs and prostitution and that uh, somebody was probably going to buy drugs at one of the hotels around the corner and saw my dad there and, and thought he was a, an easy target um, to rob. And uh, he we never found his wallet. Um, he was a construction worker. He may very well have cashed his check uh, the day before, Friday, if he got paid that Friday. Um, and the robber got away with a lot of money or just as likely uh, when they opened up that blue Velcro wallet, uh, there was nothing in there. I, I don't know. And I don't know that I will ever know, um, you know, that, that answer, but, um, but it really could have gone either way with the way my, my dad handled money. He was, uh, one of those blue collar workers that would, um, would cash his check on Friday afternoon, uh, pay his bills in cash, didn't, didn't use credit, didn't carry, you know, balances on credit cards. Uh, if he couldn't pay for it with cash, then he, he didn't buy it. So, um, so there is a chance that this person got away with them some money, but I, I think it's just as likely that if, uh, that my dad had a couple of bucks in his wallet and that's what he was killed over. So, um, the, I have listened to the 911 tape, uh, for 10 years. I didn't listen to it. Um, it was never made public. Uh, but at the, uh, this past October was actually when I was scheduled to speak uh, at Tallahassee Museum in person. Um, I was scheduled to speak on the 10th anniversary of my dad's murder. And, um, and that didn't work out, which was probably a good thing because the 10th anniversary ended up being much more difficult on me than I, uh, than I had anticipated. Um, so, uh, but um, but I did do a, a records request. I obtained all of the case file, including the recording of, of my dad's last call. And I wanted to hear his voice. I felt like I was forgetting what my dad sounded like. And so I, I told myself, I'm just going to hit play. And I just want to hear that part where he says, you know, they say 911, what's your emergency? And, and he just, whatever he says, like, I just want to hear his voice. And then I'm going to stop it. And, uh, but when he said that, it didn't sound like him, and he had just been shot, and he was in shock, and uh, and it's a 911 recording, 10 years old, and uh, and so I was like, well, let me just listen a little bit longer, and you know, until it sounds like him, and he's not doing most of the talking. Um, it's a lot of him in shock, and the the dispatcher trying to keep him awake and alert, um, but the the last words out of my dad's mouth are, uh, please help me. And um, so that's, you know, uh, something that haunts me. Um, um, it's something that I wasn't really prepared for. Um, after I listened to that tape, uh, I immediately took it um, upstairs in my office. There was a court reporter and I asked them if they could transcribe it so that if I ever needed to, to refer to it again, I could just read it on paper and not have to listen to it. And, uh, and, and they did that for me. So I, Lacey, I'm seeing a question down here that wasn't in the questions, but it's in the, the chat. So um, yes. a couple of questions, actually, are those. Um, what I think is the Terry, you rape? answered. Yeah, I think the rape, yeah. set, the rape kit when you answered. Um, yeah. But Shuri's about the television show. Um, yeah, uh, with the new television show on how, how do you think it would be to get our case looked at on a big DNA company called Parabon Nano Labs? Uh, yeah, so I, I know uh, Shuri there and, and her, uh, she's one of our families that we that we help. Her mother was murdered in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida in 1980, um, uh, 81. And uh, she, uh, we have worked so hard on her case, uh, her mom's case, trying to get the information out there and, and help in any way that we can. Unfortunately, um, in your mom's case, Sheree, the, um, the, the suspect, um, his DNA is expected to be at the, uh, at the scene. And so a, a, a company like um, uh, Parabon Nanolabs 
um, they're not going to look for DNA. It would be a case where they don't know who the suspect is, is when genetic genealogy is used and when DNA is used. Um, in a case where the suspect um, may live in that house or his, his or her DNA is expected to be in that house um, because they were known to be there uh, before the crime, um, that kind of technology will not assist in those cases. So um, I don't think Parabon would be able to help, unfortunately, in, in, your, in your mom's case. Um, Diane asked, you said uh, you made a records request. What records did they actually release to you? So uh, public records laws, especially in Florida, are very open. We have very open sunshine laws, um, which means pretty much everything is, is public record. Uh, unless it's an active investigation. So, um, so depending on the jurisdiction where your loved one's case is, you can do a, a, a Freedom of Information Act uh, public records request for your loved one's case file. Um, they're obviously not gonna release evidence to you, um, but I got all of the reports, the supplemental reports in my dad's case, the follow-up reports from years later when they tried to touch DNA, I got the uh, the 911 call uh, recording. I got photos. Uh, my dad was not, um, he had lost consciousness at the scene, but he was transported to the hospital where he was um, declared deceased. So there were no photos of him at the actual crime scene. The crime scene photos were a few blood drops, uh, my dad's cell phone on the sidewalk, um, and then the, the inside of the building. Um, but there was, uh, you know, there were photos of him uh, deceased, but they were not at the scene and there was only one or two of them. Uh, but the, the catch 22 of that is if you want law enforcement to be looking at your loved one's case, uh, and if they are actively investigating it, then those uh, records are exempt from public, uh, from release to the public. So uh, it's a catch 22. You can look at the files if, if the case is cold, if you want law enforcement to be looking at it, then it's active and they're not gonna release it. There are also situations where law enforcement agencies have said any um, unsolved case is still open and active and they refuse to release um, that information, but that, that's kind of one of those gray areas where I think the, the intention of the law was that Active means you are actively looking at the case and investigating it, not just that it's open because uh, there's no statute of limitations on murder. So um, uh, a murder case remains open. They don't close it just because they don't make an arrest, um, but they would have to um, actively, you know, it, in my opinion, the spirit of the law is if they're actively looking at the case, they will not release that information. Um, but I know there are some agencies that, that use the other, uh, you know, interpretation. So, um, so that would be my answer. You'd have to, to call. I, and I know Diane is another survivor, one of our families. And, um, you know, and our goal with, um, with her husband's case was to, um, was that it's active. They are looking at it. Uh, in fact, pre COVID, um, she, her family was supposed to be the next one in our series with, um, with the local media and law enforcement to, uh, to raise awareness for her husband's case. Um, and it got canceled in March because of COVID and they have not regrouped. Although the press conference that they had today, they invited me to, we were all masked up, but we were in the, the same room where we typically do those, um, those spotlights on cold cases. So hopefully Diane will be um, getting that uh, information out soon and doing another story. Um, and for anybody else that's listening, you know, uh, that has a cold case potentially, you know, reach out to the, to the law enforcement agency, uh, do a, a Freedom of Information Act request, a FOIA is what they call it, and, uh, and you can request that and see what they say. Um, they may, you know, their interpretation of the law may be that that, that information is exempt, um, but they may provide it. But I would also caution every family, um, like you just heard my story about the the 911 recording. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. And um, um, so, you know, be very cautious. One of the things that we do 
um, is we offer our families that if you do get your case file and you would like us to review it and us to go through it with you or us to pull out the photos that are graphic or um, you know the recordings you know we can get them transcribed stuff like that so that it's not as traumatic I think depending on you know particularly where you are in your grieving process this can be um, this can certainly be uh, a trigger you know it will be a trigger I mean I'll just say it will be a trigger so uh, but our office and agency does offer those kinds of services services that we could review that stuff and then sit down with you and say look we've sealed up the photos in this envelope they're yours. It is ultimately your decision, um, but they have been separated from everything else, and we feel like you know this would be less traumatic. So, got another question from Michelle. Have you ever found roadblocks in investigations among the authorities regarding um, the privilege of deceased persons? Um, we've hit a, seen a lot of roadblocks in investigations among uh, authorities, uh, but regarding privilege of deceased persons, no, not anything that I can think of specifically. In fact, there's a, 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 a faction of people that are, um, that are really pushing hard for deceased people's DNA to be collected, um, you know, uh, from the hospital, from, you know, during autopsy, whether they're criminals, whether they're anybody, um, so that they could be run against uh, known um, cold cases and try to resolve them. Because we do know that, um, that you know, if, if a cold case suspect dies and, you know, that it could be, um, you know, it could die with them, that case, and never be resolved. Um, so um, we have heard people talk about that. Um, you know, there's obviously privacy concerns. The big issue there is, again, does do you maintain privacy once you're deceased or do those uh, rights to, to privacy um, disappear once you're deceased? And, and that's, you know, that, I don't get to make that decision. <laughs> so um, another question, have you seen in Wakula County asking who killed Jody Kilgore? Do you know anything about this case? Uh, I have seen that. Uh, I don't know anything about that case specifically other than uh, we have reached out to law enforcement and, and offered to assist in raising awareness uh, for that case, uh, which is something we do anytime we see, you know, uh, law enforcement, you know, trying to raise awareness. Uh, we offer our services to assist. Um, we, I would say, generally have a really, really good working relationship with law enforcement. Um, we are outsiders. I'm not prior law enforcement. I'm not a detective. So I do sometimes get uh, met with resistance, um, but uh, usually once they understand what we do and why we do it and that we're not trying to um, encroach on their investigation, we're not trying to take credit for, you know, their investigation, we're not trying to point fingers and blame uh, within their investigation, that our focus is on these families and making sure that every single family knows that their loved one matters and that their loved one is not forgotten. And, and we do that by, by raising awareness. Uh, most um, agencies uh, understand that and then they become you know, big supporters uh, and partners with us. Um, so we, you know, uh, we're always, we feel like we have, well, we know in five years of existence, we have gotten a lot more done um, working with law enforcement than working uh, against them. Uh, so Deb has a question. Can you share more about what volunteers can do to help? Uh, when you said volunteers uh, help raise awareness and advocate for the families, what does that mean? So in our organization, we do utilize volunteers, although with uh, COVID, you know, we don't have uh, those volunteers and those options uh, right now. But we use interns from the University of North Florida. Uh, we use interns from Flagler College. Um, we're trying to get into some more universities and utilize uh, interns from there and volunteers. And, you know, this is not the popular answer, but it's, it's the easiest answer. So, you know, we're a nonprofit and what do nonprofits do? They always ask for money. They always ask you to, to support them. We don't do that. I mean, of course, we still, you know, are a nonprofit and we need private donations, but we never ask a family for money. We never charge for our services. And when somebody asks how they can help, we have, you know, the easiest thing you can do that doesn't cost you a dollar. 
um, it doesn't um, it doesn't take up your much of your time or your energy and that is share the stories that we share on social media so uh, Facebook algorithms are as complicated as you know genetic genealogy and maybe beyond uh, but the one way you can reach the most people is through having other people engage in your post and that means commenting liking sharing and um, and that's really 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 what we ask people to do um, is is um, is to you know is to share our information um, you know uh, obviously we do have um, have volunteers that come in sometimes we get and I'm not ignoring you all I'm going to show you um, we get mail like this from law enforcement that, that goes into our cold case database um, and all of this has to be reviewed looked through and then um, you know data entry and collected um, I think Michelle's trying to ask if we're only in Florida yeah I think that's what, uh, so we are based in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, we have a grant to serve all of Florida. Um, but I cannot, and my staff, we cannot turn our back on somebody because they live elsewhere. So what we do is, whether it's after hours, you know, as volunteer time ourselves or with volunteers, we also assist families outside of Florida. Um, but are, we're limited in what we can do. In Florida, we can facilitate meetings with law enforcement in person. Uh, we've done plenty of meetings with uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, Clay County Sheriff's Office, Jacksonville Beach PD, St. Johns County Sheriff's Office, you know, all of the surrounding areas, Baker County Sheriff's Office. We have um, facilitated meetings with families in person. Sometimes we do that at the station. Uh, sometimes we do that um, uh, in our office. We found that families are a little more comfortable uh, when they're meeting with law enforcement, if it's if they don't have to go through metal detectors, if they're not brought into a you know what looks like an interrogation room um, to ask questions, so we utilize our conference room uh, for law enforcement that will travel up, you know, or that will come to our office, and many will. Um, we have funding that we can travel to other places. We also have Zoom capabilities like this where we can set up uh, and facilitate meetings for families and law enforcement. So that helps. We offer support meetings for, uh, for families. We did that for, for the most part in person. With COVID, we couldn't. Uh, so we started doing virtual support meetings. And now we have people from Alaska, California, um, all over that, that log in, um, you know, and, and seek uh, assistance and advocacy. Um, so yeah, we, you know, our, our grant funding is for Florida. And so that's where our Monday through Friday, eight to five hours are, are spent. Um, but beyond that, um, if somebody from outside of the state reaches out to us, we don't turn them away. So, um, so we will help however we can. Anything I missed? Any other questions? I am not seeing anything. Has anybody got anything? Oh, Phyllis, you raised your hand. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Uh, do you, uh, how many do you have full-time um, employees and then the rest are just? Yes, so uh, we have three full-time uh, paid employees um, that, that work, you know, we have an office in, uh, in downtown Jacksonville. Um, when I talked about that press conference earlier today, I literally walked to the police memorial building. Um, I can walk to the courthouse. I can walk to the state attorney's office. Um, I can walk to city hall. So we, and we're central in the city for families that come to us uh, when we were having support meetings or facilitated meetings with law enforcement. So we, we have an office, um, three full-time employees. Uh, the last semester we had two interns from UNF. Uh, we had another volunteer from UNF. We had a volunteer from Flagler, um, college and um and then we kind of utilize volunteers here and there um we we do those spotlights every week and and quite honestly my uh, journalism skills are horrible uh so i i lean heavily on um on volunteers that have some experience in journalism to help us with those spotlights uh we do a 
uh, a project with the UNF journalism class every year where we give them 20 cases the, the families have agreed that they want um, their cases spotlighted and the students reach out and contact them and um, uh, you know um, uh, do the stories and then put them out there and um, and so we go in and train and teach the the journalism students and hopeful hoping that they will carry these these um, you know lessons on further in their career and how to approach a family uh, things that are appropriate to say and things that are inappropriate to say um, questions that are acceptable to ask and those kinds of things so um, uh, thank you Michelle I, I really appreciate that uh, that means a lot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I know that my dad never wanted to be the poster child um, for unsolved murder and for cold cases. And I certainly didn't see myself uh, in this role. You know, I was 31 years old when my dad was murdered um, and I had a career. So uh, this is not where I saw myself. This, you know, um, sometimes when you're uh, searching for a passion, you know, it finds you and it's not always the, the you know, the best situation, but uh, this is my passion. I, I love what I do. I hate that I have to do it, but, uh, but I absolutely love getting up every morning, coming into this office, um, answering calls, talking to families, um, trying to figure out ways that we can um, uh, assist. So, uh, so Don is a, a cold case TV binger, lived in Jacksonville, uh, and can visualize your location. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, sharing his story. I mean, I, you know, I appreciate it. Um, I, you know, I, I don't take compliments well if you can't tell, but uh, <laughs> you're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate everything that you guys say. Uh, we don't do it for... Um, for recognition. Uh, we don't do it for fame or fortune, obviously. Um, so, uh, but we do it because it's the right thing to do. And we do it because, um, you know, it, it needs to be done and somebody has to do it. So, mm -hmm. um, so somebody asked when our next fundraising event is. I have no idea, Sharon. Um, <laughs> we are, uh, you know, we have an annual one in January every year, which we snuck in right before. <laughs> Um, COVID-19 took us all down, uh, you know, we're really kind of wondering how that's going to play out and whether we can, you know, can do an event this year or whether we're going to have to do Zoom events. But, you know, follow our Facebook page. Um, you know, we will definitely let everybody know. Um, and then Ken said, a good friend of ours was murdered in Jacksonville a number of years ago. His family is all gone now. He was gay and found dead in a closet in his apartment. Is this something you might help us with? So if his family is all gone now, reach out to us. Um, we, we like to have family permission, obviously, um, to, to raise awareness for, for a case. Uh, but in a situation like that, um, we would make an exception because just because uh, the family is gone doesn't mean um, that, that we shouldn't fight for, for justice and answers. Um, for, for that individual. So um, I, my email address was up there earlier, ryanb at projectcoldcase.org. Um, you can go to our website. There's a case submission tab under the contact button. Um, and, and we'll try to help however we can for sure. Uh, I, we don't, you know, again, we're, all, we're always erring on the side of helping, not on the side of saying no. So um, typically we would want family permission if the family's all gone, then, you know, we would certainly make an exception. Um, uh, yes, thank you for posting that, Lacey. So, um, so yes, you all are welcome. I really appreciate the fact that you found uh, this topic interesting enough to, to sit here for an hour and to, uh, to listen to me. Um, uh, again, uh, this is my passion. It's what we do every single day. It's my full-time job and, uh, and two other employees, and, and we are... Uh, we, we actually take it very, very seriously and are honored to um, when families allow us to help them. So, um, so thank you all um, for, for joining me tonight. Oh, we are so grateful to have you, Ryan. Um, obviously, you're very well loved and uh, the love is well deserved. Um, you've got lots of postings, very interesting. They love you. We love you, Ryan, Sharon. Yeah, um, love you too, yeah Sharon. thank you so much for joining us. 
Um, you can see behind me, we've got a big event coming up at the museum. I'll have to move over. Swamp Stomps coming this week, this next weekend, July 11th. If you're in Tallahassee, please come by. Um, we will be social distancing. Um, we have regulations set up if you're able to come. Um, members are free, so if you're able to stop by. And next week, um, for our virtual lecture, we will be talking about dolphins with um, Lindsay Hooper. So she's going to be discussing sipping with science, dive into dolphins. Um, bottom of those dolphins, their social structures, behaviors, how to identify them, and more. Um, so if you're able to be here, we would love to see everyone. And then we'll be back the following week again with another uh, Cocktails and Crime uh, topic. So if you want to join back with that, um, we'll be back with crime. Again, Ryan, thank you so much. And I've, I'm really thankful for you um, sticking with me for the year and being <laughs> able to <laughs> finally get this underhand. I'm glad we were able to do it, Lacey. I appreciate Me you staying too. on top of it. Me too. And anything we can do for you, like you said, you know, people run away, but I will not run away. Anything you need, um, I'm here. Um, so please reach out and uh, we would be happy to help share any anything you need. Thank you, Lacey. I All right. appreciate that. Please pass All on right. my, my thanks. Absolutely. Everyone, please be safe. Oh, we got another new message. Great hour. Thank you. Excellent job, everyone. Please be safe out there, and we will see you next week. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.